What is going on, Warriors? Now, we got an exciting episode for you today. I pulled in an expert. We're going to have a chat on DKA, or diabetic ketoacidosis. We're going to talk about what it is, how to prevent it, how to treat it. But keep in mind, nothing said on this podcast or in this video is medical advice. Do seek the attention of your doctors if you have any concerns at all. Uh, but with that being said, let's jump into our theme song. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandevecht, head coach and co-founder of FTF Warrior, and welcome to Part of My Pancreas. Welcome back, Warriors, to the Pardon My Pancreas podcast. We have a very exciting guest today, and we're going to go over a topic that I have been very curious about for years, honestly. <laughs> so today we're bringing on uh, someone who has their master's degree, going to drop some knowledge on us, as well as personal experience with our topic of the day, which is DKA. Some of you may be familiar with this from a personal perspective, hopefully not, but if you are, this episode should shed some light shed some light on what went on and how we can better deal with it to prepare and to deal with it in the moment. So today we have on Stephanie Johnson, MS. Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. The work that you have been doing in the diabetic community is so inspiring. It has inspired me to share my knowledge and my experience. And so thank you so much for having me. Oh, that's amazing. And I, I came across your, uh, your profile I would love for you to share us your, your username real quick on Instagram. I thought it was clever. Uh, my, my username is the cranky panky on Instagram. Uh, if you are actually looking for me, it's going to be the underscore cranky underscore panky. But yeah, the cranky panky. There's even a website, the cranky panky.com. Exactly. Yeah. I was just saying that that's a reference to the cranky pancreas, right? Yes. I love it. It's not, the, it's not the other one. Don't Google it. Oh. Okay, I don't know why, but I'm gonna avoid Google for that one. <laughs> but uh, Stephanie, so we're talking about DKA today, but first I kind of wanted to take a look into your diagnosis story and uh, ask you, what was that like for you? Yeah, so what um, brought me in to my doctor, um, I had a little bit of experience with diabetes prior to my diagnosis. Um, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 31. And kind of, I'll just give you like a brief overview of kind of what that looked like and what my symptoms were, because um, they're not really the stereotypical symptoms that you hear about when someone is diagnosed with DKA and then with diabetes. Typically, you'll hear, um, hey, I went to my doctor, I had these flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, wasn't feeling well, and then, oh my gosh, I have diabetes. Um, my experience was a little bit different. I kind of went to my doctor and was like, hey, I need some insulin. <laughs> um, so my symptoms of DKA were a little bit different than what you would typically see. Um, but I can kind of walk you through the process of kind of how DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, kind of starts to develop and progresses to that eventual point where you do have the nausea, the vomiting. You're like, hey, something's not right. I need to go to the doctor. And then yeah. you're hit with that diagnosis. Or if you already have diabetes, you may be familiar with DKA already, but maybe you don't know how it starts. You don't know how to prevent it. Um, so we can talk about some things that you can do to actually prevent it as well as the treatment that you could expect to receive when you go to the doctor and it's present with DKA. You got DKA at diagnosis. Like it was just part of your diagnosis story, right? Yes. So when I presented to the doctor, I was in DKA um, and also I knew when I went to the doctor that, hey, I have a blood sugar of 350. Oh, I had had a meter, um, just a little like $19 meter from Walmart. I had been testing my sugar ever since I was pregnant with my son. And every once in a while I would get the shakes and I was like, maybe, maybe I have a low blood sugar. I don't know. So I would test my sugar. It always came back normal um, until it didn't. And so <laughs> one day I was doing a juice cleanse with a coworker and we worked out every day 
five days a week, we worked out, we meal prepped together, we ate the same foods together. Most of the time I felt okay, um, but I would have these episodes where my heart would race. I would have um, kind of like felt like I couldn't breathe. Um, that's another, that can be another symptom. It's called Kesmal's respirations, where it's like a deep, rapid breathing and you feel like you can't catch your breath. And so I would feel like I was going to pass out, but I attributed this to while I'm working out, um, you know, I'm prepping for this NPC bikini competition. Maybe I just need to eat more. And so I didn't really think too much of it. I would adjust my diet. You know, I'm eating 1700 calories a day. It's not that much of a cut. Shouldn't really be that. So it wasn't super obvious to me that it was, you know, like a diabetic related thing in the beginning. So we start this juice cleanse and I'm like, man, I feel kind of weird today. Let me check my blood sugar and see what it is. It's 350. And I'm like, well, that's not good. Went for a walk for 45 minutes. It didn't go down. Typically when I would test my sugar before I'd go for a walk 15 minutes, it would lower. Everything would be fine. This time it didn't. So I went into the doctor. I said, hey, my blood sugar is 350. I need some insulin. And they were like, we can hook you up with that. <laughs> And they said, well, you're in shape. Uh, you're you're kind of skinny. Like, you are you don't fit the typical profile of a diabetic. So, sorry we didn't look at this sooner. Uh, you did have pancreatitis the year before that was pretty severe. Maybe that damaged your pancreas or something and you're having some issues now. I don't know. So, I went in. Um, regardless of what stage you're at, if you go into the doctor with DKA, the treatment is the same. Make sure you're hydrated and make sure you have insulin. So typically you don't really realize you're in DK until you have those higher blood sugar levels. So like mine was 350 and they're like, hey, you're in DK. Mm -hmm. um, but you can actually be in DK at a lower blood sugar level. DKA isn't caused by the high blood sugar levels. The high blood sugar levels are more of a result of DKA. Okay. And so it's actually caused by a lack of insulin. So either you don't have enough insulin or you don't have any insulin. Um, and your body needs insulin to function. And so not having that insulin kind of sets off a domino effect <clears throat> where eventually your blood sugar will reach those higher levels. And that's typically when you're like, hey, something's not right. Right. So you're probably super confused now. You're like, oh, well, what do you mean? I thought, you know, I need to look for DKA when my blood sugar is too high, but now you're telling me I can be in DKA while my blood sugar is low? How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> and so typically what that looks like is say I'm sick, I have the flu, I'm throwing up, I can't keep any food down. I am not super confident in my basal levels. Um, I'm concerned that if I don't eat, I'm going to have a low blood sugar. I'm going to go hypoglycemic. Um, so maybe I turn off my insulin. I turn it down. Maybe I turn it off completely. Um, either way, I no longer have insulin coming in. So my blood sugar may be at a normal level at this point, and I'm not eating. So I haven't done anything that's going to make it go up noticeably right away. But once that insulin that I had running as my basal runs out, I'm on the pump. So that'll be about four hours from the time I turn it off. Mm -hmm. Then I don't have enough insulin. And so we don't just use insulin when we eat. Our body needs insulin to function. So at that point, if you think about the, the glucose in your blood as gasoline and the insulin as a car, and then your muscles and cells as a destination. The insulin is actually a transport vehicle for that glucose. So even though my blood sugar seems okay right now, my cells and muscles aren't getting the sugar into them because they're not being transported by this transport vehicle, the insulin. Mm -hmm. So when your cells and muscles get hungry. They're like, hey, where's my sugar? I called a car, you know, 20 minutes ago. 
what happened? I'm hungry. Uh, <laughs> they, they decide, well, I guess, you know, my pizza's not coming. Let me uh, call up some fat and protein and see if I can get them to hook me up with something to eat. And so you are probably familiar with eating a high fat meal or a high protein meal. And then a few hours later, your blood sugar spikes. Sure. And you're like, hey, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, your body starts breaking down these fats and proteins into fuel. And typically when your body breaks down fat, it will convert to ketones and then your muscles can use those ketones. So if you think about someone on the keto diet, mm -hmm. they wanna be in ketosis, which is different from BKA. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the difference there in a I'd minute. Love to cover but, that, yeah. <clears throat> um, so because you don't have insulin, you don't have that transport vehicle, the muscles still aren't getting the ketones, they're not getting the glucose, and that just starts to build up and build up and build up in your blood. So no matter how much gasoline you pour, if you don't have the car, it's not going to get there. Mm. So without the insulin, your body's not going to get that fuel and it's going to keep requesting more and have it build up and build up and build up in your bloodstream until you have this abundance of glucose. And so now you're starting to see your blood sugar climb. You're starting to see those higher numbers. You're starting to build up ketones and all of this excess, your body's like, well, I need to get rid of this somehow. It's not going into the cells and the muscle tissue. So what am I gonna do now? So it starts to spill over into the urine. And so that's when you start to have these symptoms of polyuria, which is the excess of urination, polydipsia, which is the excess of drinking. And so what that feels like to you is that excessive thirst where you just can't quench your thirst. Um, and then, you know, maybe if you haven't been diagnosed yet, you're like, man, why do I have to get up in the middle of the night five times a night to go to the bathroom? What's going on here? Right. Um, <laughs> so you'll have, you'll have those types of symptoms. Um, and so when the ketones build up, they also start to convert to acetone, which mm -hmm. you might be familiar with acetone as a nail polish remover. You kind of don't want that flowing through your veins, right? It's, it's very acidic. And so that's where the acidosis part comes from, from the diabetic ketoacidosis the pH in your body starts to change. It becomes more acidic. Your blood becomes more acidic. And because of this, when you're excreting this, this acidic uh, you know, fluid at this point, your body's gonna try to buffer that with sodium. And sodium is gonna pull even more volume, more water from your body, and you're gonna start to become dehydrated. Once the body gets to this dehydrated state, that's when you really start to see those more stereotypical common symptoms of the nausea, the vomiting, the dehydration, the electrolyte imbalances, and those types of things that you'll present to typically with your doctor, because at that point you're like, hey, something's going on here. So that's kind of the, the process of, of how it starts, how it builds up. It's not typically like an immediate thing like, oh, my blood sugar is high, I'm going to be in DKA. Um, if your blood sugar is high for a short time and it comes back down with your meals, maybe you have an after meal spike or something, that's not necessarily going to put you in DKA. <clears throat> not having enough insulin over a long enough period of time is what's going to do that. Okay. Can I ask you a question on that then? You mentioned <clears throat> you can go into DKA with like a normal blood sugar, let's say, because mm -hmm. of the lack of insulin. So maybe it's heightened activity over the last couple of days kept you on a lower spectrum and you took the pump off, right? Now you don't have enough insulin, you could go into DKA. Does having a DKA or going into DKA at a normal blood sugar mean that you are on your way to a higher blood sugar or could you stay in lower blood sugars and remain in DKA? So a lot of that would depend on how you eat. So if I were to use myself as an example, I could theoretically have a pretty low blood sugar for a pretty long time before it built up enough because I will eat pretty low carb. Most of my carbs come from vegetables. I exercise a lot, um, but you will start to notice, hey, my body is not quite working right. Something's happening. You'll start getting muscle cramps. You'll have symptoms of that dehydration because it's pulling 
the electrolytes out of your body. Mm -hmm. And so for a short period of time, yeah, you might have a normal blood sugar, but eventually it's going to have that snowball effect where your cells and your muscles are requesting more fuel. And so your body's going to start generating those ketones and turning that fat and protein into glucose and it will eventually build up. And with the, uh, the glucose being spilled out in the urine, is that always uh, a symbol of DKA or symbol, symptom of DKA? For example, if somebody is struggling with diabulimia, does that mean that they're in DKA because they're peeing out the urine, not using insulin? Um, you're saying if they have ketones? So let's say that they haven't tested for ketones, but uh, you know, there's eating disorder, diabulimia, where you restrict insulin or just don't take insulin in mm -hmm. order to try to lose weight and you pee out the glucose. Is peeing out the glucose uh, always associated with DKA or could those be separate in some cases? Those could be separate. Um, excreting glucose or even ketones doesn't necessarily mean you're in DKA. So it's really a long period of time without insulin usually is what will put you into DKA. So typically someone who hasn't been diagnosed yet that presents to their doctor in DKA, you know, they'll have not had enough insulin for a pretty long time, you know, months mm -hmm. at a time. Like for me, my A1C was 13.1%. So my average blood sugar on a daily basis was 350. Man. So that kind of puts it in perspective. And DKA can be life-threatening because typically it's at this later stage that you're finally getting diagnosed and realizing that there's a problem. Um, so when you go in, the doctor will hydrate you, maybe put you on an IV, make sure you're getting the insulin that you need. <clears throat> they will monitor your um, blood sugar and then they'll just monitor, see how things go. If you get better or worse, that sort of thing. So if you are having these symptoms at home, it seems like, you know, it's pretty simple. Okay, hydrate, take my insulin, uh, monitor my sugar. Those really are, it is basically that simple if you're not in an extreme, you know, needing immediate medical assistance type of situation. So if you're testing for ketones, having those ketones spill over into the urine, that's what allows you to test at home. Your doctor's probably giving you keto sticks or something like that that you can use to check for ketones. Yeah. So if your blood sugar is high and you have ketones, you know, try to determine where is insulin missing? What, what happened? Did I forget to bolus for my meal that I just had? Or do I have a problem with my infusion site? Did I miss some basal insulin for some reason? Did I, you know, forget to take my Lantus shot? Um, try to determine where you went wrong kind of not not wrong but like right. why the insulin is missing so right. that just so you can have an idea of how much insulin you need if you know hey i ate this and i forgot to bolus you can take your bolus um, so you want to take that missing insulin and hydrate and then monitor for ketones and your blood sugar every one to four hours and just kind of see how things are going if you feel shortness of breath, or you feel like you're going to pass out, or you're having trouble staying conscious, then you definitely want to seek medical attention right away. Gotcha. And let's say that you figured out your checklist, right? Which, where am I missing the insulin from? Oh, I forgot to bolus for my lunch meal. Uh, if you forgot to bolus completely, you know, obviously there's different strategies like an IM shot, for example, and the muscle tissue can bring sugars down a lot faster. Is there any danger from bringing blood sugars from like a 400 down into range with an IM shot that quickly? Should that be avoided or is that still a good strategy? Um, I mean, that's gonna be person to person depending on how you wanna feel. Um, it could put your body into kind of a shock state. Even when you go to the hospital, if your blood sugar is highly elevated, they're gonna to try to slowly bring that down. Hmm. So my personal strategy is usually to take half of my correction up front and then I'll do a basal increase temporarily for oh, okay. a few hours and then that'll kind of like it'll give me a drop down a little bit but then it'll just kind of slowly take me down the rest of the way and you can kind of land the plane smoothly without you know sometimes you overdo it and <laughs> you're on the roller coaster and yeah. nobody likes that 
It happens. You know, every once in a while we make mistakes or sometimes things just happen that we didn't plan on, right? Yep. So that's all right. Um, interesting though, because I've heard rumors that you shouldn't drop too fast and it can damage your brain if you go from like a 400 to a 100 too quickly. But I don't know if that was true or not. So yeah, um, actually talking a little bit more about the brain and the glucose. So your brain is actually the only part of your body that doesn't need insulin as a transport vehicle. So when you're experiencing this hyperglycemia too high of a blood sugar, your brain is still functioning. It can still <laughs> absorb, right? It can still absorb that glucose and use that sugar. Um, but if you suddenly take it all away, then yeah, your, your brain's gonna, it's gonna have something to say about that. So you might notice when you are hypoglycemic, it's kind of the opposite. You kind of start to lose motor function, brain function. Um, sometimes people can't help themselves when they're hypoglycemic. Um, so your brain runs on sugar. And if you take all of its sugar away or you take a lot of it away too fast, it can definitely cause some complications. Yeah. And I've definitely been there with the hypos, right? Where the brain's like, I don't know where I am right now. <laughs> Somebody get me some sugar. I'm um, not drunk. You're drunk. Right? Oh, man, that's the scary part, too. If you're out partying and, yeah, people aren't going to know if you're low or drunk. It's like, mm -hmm. that can be a dangerous situation quick, you know? Um, you mentioned something about, you know, sodium pulling water away, being dehydrated. Is there something to be said about rehydrating with electrolytes at hand? Is that beneficial? Yes, absolutely. And I, I recommend finding uh, an electrolyte supplement that is not necessarily like Gatorade or one of those sugary drinks, because if you're already having a high blood sugar and you're trying to get it down, you don't want to <laughs> exacerbate that situation. Right. And there are some good sugar-free options out there that will help you rehydrate and rebalance. There's, um, there is even some mixtures you can make at home, adding a little bit of salt to your water. Um, and that type of thing. So you can definitely get creative with it. All right, very cool. So we got the three stages, right? We got take insulin, drink water, and incorporate electrolytes if you can. And that's if you have it. So we know how it happens, what to do if you have it, which of course can also include going to the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and having them help you out. Um, we know a little bit about the science behind it now, which is awesome. Thank you for providing that. Within DKA, uh, I'd love to touch on the difference between, there's a lot of misconception here, the difference between going into ketosis and into diabetic ketoacidosis. Right. So the main difference between ketosis and diabetic ketoacidosis is that lack of insulin. So ketones are naturally occurring in your body. They're a natural form of fuel that your muscles can use. So if you're on a low carb diet, and you're in ketosis, you're basically burning fat. It's ketones are the result of fat burning. And so when they say, you know, that you're burning fat as fuel instead of carbs as fuel, that's kind of what that means. So when you start to burn fat as fuel, you'll generate these ketones, but they'll be transported into the muscles and the cells and all of the tissues that need them because you have insulin. And so in diabetic ketoacidosis, you're going to start to have this metabolic acidosis where the pH changes in your body, you become more acidic. You're not able to use those ketones as fuel at all because they don't have a transport vehicle to get there. Hmm. So it's really the lack of insulin that causes this buildup, which then creates the acidosis piece where your body starts to become acidic. So it sounds like uh, for those thinking that the keto diet might be the cure for type one, you still need insulin to make you the keto diet. You still need insulin, yes. Yeah, okay. So I shouldn't go cure <laughs> myself <laughs> with keto. <laughs> That's good to know. So they both use insulin. Um, and I actually have a, a curious question for you from a few different listeners and people who asked me in the past too, I didn't know how to answer it, honestly. Uh, are some people more susceptible to going into DKA than others? Well, that I would have to say, I mean, I would have to say yes, because it really depends on your management. Um, if you've already been diagnosed, if you 
<clears throat> have yet to be diagnosed, then that, I mean, I can't speak to your DNA and your genes and what you're going to come down with to, to say XYZ is, you know, more susceptible. I did actually do the uh, ancestry DNA testing and I ran it through this program and it did say that I had a gene that put me at very high risk of developing type 1 diabetes. Interesting. So there are some programs out there that some software that will analyze your DNA and so if you are into that you can check it out. <clears throat> um, me and both my sisters have the same gene. I'm the only one, <clears throat> sorry, that has the type 1 diabetes. Um, but then as far as like, if you're, if you are already diabetic, are you more prone to, <clears throat> um, DKA? That's really going to depend on how you manage your insulin. True. Yeah. Make sure you're taking your insulin. <clears throat> Don't skip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reason I ask is I know that there are some people like yourself who were diagnosed with DKA and they kind of go in tandem, right? Uh, people like myself and I think that this is more of a rare thing but I've actually never been in DKA officially maybe I was at some point and didn't know it but I've never been told that I was in DKA I wonder if there were certain factors that maybe assisted with that and uh, not and in no way does that make anyone better or worse I need to clarify that right up front <laughs> but i uh, curious about that because I've also gone through phases in my life where I've had fear surrounding type 1 diabetes surrounding low blood sugars and there was a night when I first got on the insulin pump where my blood sugars kept going down. My basal rates, I didn't set properly at that point. And I was still trying to figure out how to do that whole thing because I was shifting off of Lantus. And uh, I got frustrated. I took my pump off, I turned it off, and I threw it downstairs, and I went back to bed. <laughs> and then I woke up, you know, I was like 300 or something. But I never, as far as I know, went into DKA. Do you know of any... Am I yeah, just lucky? so like no, I'm, I'm actually <laughs> glad you brought that up because uh, my doctor never actually told me that I was in DKA okay. because when I went to the doctor, the treatment was the same regardless of whether or not he said the words, right? Um, but I'm one of those people that actually goes and gets all of my lab work and my medical record and I get copies of it after all of my visits and I go through all of the results and I do research and I look everything up. What does this mean? What does that mean? And I'm like, oh, I was in DKA. They didn't even mention that. I thought this was like, you know, a super scary, crazy thing that why wouldn't they mention that? And it's yeah. really because the treatment is the same. Take insulin, make sure you're hydrated. As long as you're not incapacitated and you can do those things, you're, you're on your way to healing. Very interesting. And now that you mentioned that, I'm thinking, okay, you could easily self-regulate without knowing it, right? You take mm -hmm. more insulin to fix the high blood sugar, not really as as in your NDK. You drink water because you're thirsty and you know it's going to help bring blood sugars down. You could have brought yourself out of DKA without even knowing it, that you were right. ever there, right? So that that's interesting. Who knows? Maybe we've all been in DKA and haven't been told. <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible. Yeah. Okay. So, and there's also another question surrounding exercise and DK. I know that a lot of us are told by doctors and endos that, you know, once you reach a certain threshold, typically I've been told about 250, that if you're up in that range, you should not go do an intense exercise, a big workout because you run the risk of going into DKA. Is there truth behind that? Is that just a generalized warning to keep us safe? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good topic. So, Remember how I talked about when you're in DKA, your muscles are hungry. They're like, hey, I need some fuel. And then they start to request fuel from fat and protein and it initiates that snowball effect that increases your glucose. So if your blood sugar is already at 250 and you don't have enough insulin and you try to go exercise, your muscles are gonna say, hey, now I'm really hungry. Let's put this into overdrive. And then you do run the risk of, if you're not already in DKA, becoming in a state of DKA because your muscles are requesting that fuel. Mm -hmm. And so the fat and the protein is breaking down and that's gonna just increase your blood sugar even more. 
And so it is better if you can get at least a little bit of insulin going, get down into a safer range. And if you're about to exercise, like for me personally, if my blood sugar's over 180 or over 200 and I'm like, hey, I wanna exercise, so I don't really wanna overdo it, I'll only correct to that 180 because I know, okay, now I've got some insulin going. Mm-hmm. It can start to transport some of that glucose into my muscles that I'm about to use. And then you can kind of go from there and you know the exercise is gonna make you more sensitive and you're gonna use up even more of that glucose that's in your stores. I love that, because that's actually a hint at one of our next episodes is going into why you shouldn't give a full correction and then go for a run, right? Because right. who knows how far you're gonna drop. You don't wanna go into like the 50s. Yeah, fantastic uh, you know, piece of knowledge right there is just to give a little bit of a correction so you help get your blood sugars lower and then see what happens, then finish your workout, especially if you're set on working out, right? You're like, I'm going to the gym. I need some insulin. (laughs) Let's go. I overdid it a little bit. Those five gram low carb tortillas weren't really five grams. Now I'm 177 with a straight up arrow. That may have happened. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Like, what, what can I do? All right, a little bit of insulin, maybe a walk or a Yeah, just, just take a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so in the realm of DKA, obviously we've covered a, a lot of the aspects of it. We've got go to the doctors and or take insulin, hydrate, electrolytes. Um, avoiding it in the first place, keep taking your insulin, make sure you have insulin circulating. What about, um, actually, is there anything that we haven't covered that you have research that you found curious yourself? I think we went through a lot of it. We went through the symptoms and there's even, there's a long list of symptoms. So, you know, like I mentioned before, the fatigue, shortness of breath, Mm -hmm. I'll share another short experience with you right after I was diagnosed. Um, I would get up in the morning, take a shower, get ready for work. And every morning in the shower, I would feel like I was going to pass out. I would get that shortness of breath, my heart would race, I'd get a little nauseous, and I'd be like, man, I feel like I'm gonna pass out, I think I need to go eat. So shortly after I was diagnosed, the next morning that happened, and I said, let me check my blood sugar. And it was actually 300. And so ever since I got on a CGM, I've noticed, hey, my blood sugar actually spikes in the shower. And so every time I was having this like feeling that I was going to pass out, shortness of breath, my heart would race, it was actually from a blood sugar spike. And so there are other symptoms that, you know, aren't the stereotypical ones that like you're already on your deathbed, I need to go to the doctor. So there's, there's more subtle things if you're more in tune. Um, anytime somebody says they feel funny, I'm like, just check your blood sugar. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, keeping blood sugars in range can put off a number of complications, struggles, frustrations. Yeah, take your insulin, stay in range as long as you can. Understand no one's perfect. Like there's, yeah, a couple basic steps we need to keep taking daily. Um, and you mentioned that there are a lot of other symptoms and things. I want to mention that you actually put together a blog piece for us, and that's going to be on our website. So if anybody wants that full list of the symptoms as well as basically the write-up of what we're talking about, uh, Stephanie put together an amazing piece that's going to be over at ftfwarrior.com. So you guys can go check out her writing, uh, her article on this, because she's got an amazing, it's just in-depth knowledge of DK. So definitely check that out. Um, now Stephanie, as far as how we typically end these episodes, I love to know what our guests, aka you, want to share with the diabetic community, those listeners that are listening in the watchers, um, What's a golden nugget that you would give either a newly diagnosed version of you or just to the the community as a whole? What's something that you've held on to as a vital piece of information? For me personally? Yeah. Um, I would say the thing that I hold on to the most is actually from, um, I guess you'd call him like a naturopath, um, Dr. Richard Schultz. He is actually based out of California. And he would always say, stop doing the things that are making you sick and do the things that create powerful health. And for me, I really incorporate that into my diet. And then the other thing that he would always say is do the best you can for as long as you can. 
And so I just try to take that through every day, doing the best I can for as long as I can, knowing that eventually life's going to happen, something's going to happen. That's okay. Um, but you just keep doing the best you can for as long as you can. I love that. Both practical and motivational, right? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, very cool. Well, thank you for that golden nugget. Uh, so Stephanie, where can our listeners and viewers find you? I know you kind of mentioned your social media initially, but I would love to give them uh, a way to connect with you, find your content, your knowledge base. So where can they find you online? Yeah. So, um, like we mentioned earlier, I am at the cranky panky on Instagram. I have a website, the cranky .com, And I can also be reached at the cranky panky at gmail.com. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing your depth of knowledge with us on DKA, just discussing the whole realm of what that looks like, how to avoid it, how to take care of it. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody else, make sure that you are subscribing to the Pardon My Pancreas podcast. Hit that button and uh, check out our other episodes. I'm sure you guys will find something you'll love. And as always, keep up the fight. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. I know that I actually learned some new stuff in that one, so it was fantastic. Now, remember, if you want to catch the full article on our website, head over to ftfwarrior.com. ftfwarrior.com. Check out the fight blog over there. I guarantee you'll find some excellent resources alongside this amazing article that Stephanie wrote for us. So have an amazing rest of your day. Head over to ftfwarrior.com to catch the rest of this article and keep up the fight.